you bet we're back on a given Monday at noon uh, with John David Ann of Hawaii Pacific University. He's a history professor there. We can never understand the present or the future, for that matter, without understanding history. And so um, exactly. yesterday, yesterday, uh, uh, yesterday we had a we had a, a, a one hour um, a recitation by the president uh, and it included American exceptionalism. So we thought we'd study that a little bit because John and I have talked about that before. It's ingrained right. into American history. And, uh, yeah. and, and Trump was, was really going hard on that. This is the greatest country on earth. And the question is, uh, is that true? Is that a true statement? Was it ever a true statement? John David, an mm -hmm. HPU history professor, what do you think? Okay, thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Uh, so it's an interesting question. I think it's, uh, you know, on the surface, you can say, no, <laughs> we're not an exceptional nation. <laughs> Uh, and the Trump presidency is proving this. <laughs> the, the truth well, what, is what was it? What is it? In the best of times, when the right, term came right. into use, what was the idea? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's the evolution of the term. That's another very interesting topic. But so when we talk about exceptionalism, uh, what we're talking about is two things. We're talking about the idea that the United States is a unique, exceptional, uh, uh, a unique place among all the nations of the world and then so that's the first thing you this idea of uniqueness and then the second thing is this idea that the united states is also what's the second thing jay we're unique and we're also the best the best right superior to everyone else so so uh so this is now the basis for this is very old uh we go all the way back to uh the John Winthrop's sermon that he gave on the Arbella, which was, which was a ship uh, sailing across the Atlantic and landed in the New World, landed in uh, Massachusetts Bay in 1619. So we go all the way back to John Winthrop in his sermon when he talked about, uh, you know, the, the idea that, that this new place could be a city on a hill, uh, which was essentially what he was talking about as a model for the rest of the world. And, you know, this is very steeped in religion at that point. And it's also steeped in the idea that there's a lot of pressure on this community to succeed, these Puritans to succeed. And if they don't succeed, then, you know, it will play very badly. It, in some sense, the whole covenant with God is in play with these Puritans because they're sick and tired of what's been happening to them in England. They're being persecuted in England. And then they come back to the, they come to uh, uh, Massachusetts Bay and, and the pressure's on them to make it work. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's really where the term exceptional, that's where we pulled it from. Now, John Winthrop didn't use the term exceptionalism. Um, the first use of this term, I think it's quite recent actually. Um, I think it's probably uh, uh, mid 20th century, mid 20th century, maybe even after World War II, that the actual term is being used. So, uh, but but it's become strangely, okay. This is and again, this is a very complicated issue. But strangely, in the time in which the term has come into use and become more and more a kind of litmus test for presidents, we talked about this before, Jay. But of course. President Obama was asked, do you believe in American exceptionalism? The Republicans thought they could kind of hook him, you know, get him into trouble on this. And he gave an academic answer. He said, yes, but all nations believe that they're exceptional in some ways. So, so he, in a way, he foiled them by giving the most honest and kind of uh, smart, uh, nuanced answer you can give. And that's quite true, right? This is this, you can, I've, I've read books that studied Israeli exceptionalism, British exceptionalism, the Japanese had exceptionalism. So it's, it's a very common thing for modern nations to have this idea that somehow they're special and they're superior. So it's not just the, the United States that is not even uh, exceptional in its own idea that, that it's exceptional. So <laughs> so, but but de facto, it. de facto, John, I mean, there was a time, maybe, as yeah. you say, after World War II, when, you know, we were the leader of the free world. 
that we were charitable and generous and kind and moral and, um, you know, a leader in making the world a, a better place for democracy and every all American ideals. And, we, and you could say in that period of time, we really were exceptional, that nobody rose to the level of the United States in so many ways, including military power. But but you wouldn't I, say that today. Would you say that today I, in the same I definition? No, no, Jay, no. No, I don't think so. I don't think we were exceptional. Okay, you know, look, uh, we practiced Jim Crow segregationism in the South. World War II oh, didn't right. change that. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, the military itself was segregated. African-American troops were attacked by white troops in the war. When they came home from the war, there were race riots because uh, these African-American troops, these veterans wanted the same rights as whites. Um, you know, it was, uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, there it is, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't think so. I, I think that's a, I'll be honest with you. I think that's a fairy tale that uh, Donald Trump would like to tell us that there was this time when we were exceptional and now we're moving back to that time. You know, his slogan in, in 2016 was make, you know, make the United States, uh, make America great again, right? So referring back to a time when we were in fact greater than we are now. So it played upon people's nostalgia for that time. So no, I don't think so. Um, certainly you can, you can argue that there are instances throughout American history where United support, where citizens, and even non-citizens rose up and said, hey, we got to change the system. And it's not American exceptionalism. It's actually an idea that you can improve what you've already got. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, certainly, certainly there are, there are uh, threads. Let's call them threads. You, you have constitutional threads. You have the threads from the Declaration of Independence. You have these threads that go through American history and people grab onto those threads and say, hey, this is what makes the United States uh, you know, a wonderful place to live in. Um, and they use those threads to try to push us towards a, a greater good. You know, kind of we the people uh, forming, you know, a more perfect union. I like that. Now it's, the word perfect has some problems too, but uh, I, I like that that the constitution starts with we the people and it starts with uh you know our goal of forming a more perfect union i like that i think that's perfectly fine and it doesn't have to argue that somehow we're more perfect than the british or the israelis or the japanese or that we're you know that we're actually going to become perfect that's where i don't really like the word because i don't think there's any way we're going to be perfect but uh you so, talk about threads, yeah. John. You talk about threads. One of the threads was, yeah. uh, for a long time, slavery. And slavery, right. as, I, as I mentioned before the show, in my view, slavery was avarice. In other words, you wanted to make your money and lots of it on the, on the, uh, on the back uh, of someone else. And, um, right. and screw, that, screw that person and you, and you come out ahead. And in fact, most of the millionaires yeah. in the United States up until the end of the Civil War were in the South because they got rich That's and they true. were trying to hold all on to it. Yeah. yeah and so, and so yeah. uh, avarice plays a role and there's always this tension between, you know, let's, let me protect my own stash and uh, let me do the common good. And I think sometimes uh, the common good was more important. Sometimes Jay. it wasn't. Jay, that's fantastic. Man, you get an A there. That was great. <laughs> I love that. Seriously. There, there, this is a very good point. This, it's always been intention. So let's, let's, let, let's talk about the 19th century some more because you brought it up. And so de Tocqueville, let's take uh, the, the great Alexis de Tocqueville, who was this uh, French philosopher who came to the United States and wrote a book about the United States. And uh, de Tocqueville described Americans in a way that suggests that by the 1830s, when he came to the United States and toured the United States and then wrote this book, that the United States was already developing a, an identity which maybe was focused on what you were talking about, on avarice. Because uh, de Tocqueville described the United States as a nation of smallholders, small farmers. Um, he, he wouldn't have described it as avarice 
but maybe 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 that's going too far to describe it as adverse. But but the Tocqueville described this nation of smallholders, and he thought that the genius of the nation, because we were largely a farming nation at that point, the genius of the nation was that we had these independent farmers who owned their own land controlled their own destinies, were highly independent. I said that already, independent. <laughs> How independent? Very independent. Actually, they were also linked into a commercial market, but so they were They were ambitious, they were self-supporting, and in kind of a Jeffersonian terms, they were not capable of corruption. Uh, they could support the Republic by their own efforts. Uh, so, yeah, so de Tocqueville um, argued that the material circumstances of the United States were shaping an identity, an identity in which profits and, uh, and material well-being was a big part of this equation. But, but de Tocqueville actually, I think, also associ associated this with, with a political system that would be made uh, virtuous on the basis of these smallholders. So, well, you know, we've shared um, an article in the Salon website, salon.com, yeah. um, about yeah, right. what, what Trump said and uh, whether the country really is exceptional. Um, and one of the interesting comments there uh, goes to this point you're making about individualism, rugged individualism. Yeah, and uh, right. right or wrong, what, what the author of that article said was that rugged individual is not really consistent with working for the common good. Uh, and so, you know, you have a tension there. You have a tension between right. I'm, I'm going to do individualistic things. I'm going to be strong and self-reliant and independent. And I don't really care about my neighbor. This is a tension that is also of great concern. Uh, right. No, that's right. No, and, and both good points. So, yeah, so um, so it's, it's a tricky question. So you've got exceptionalism on one side. Is the United States an exceptional nation? But what you have on the other side, I think, is still... Uh, the survival and the development of what I'll call civic virtue. So I don't necessarily agree with de Tocqueville's uh, analysis. I'm not sure that he was right in that way. And so um, I tend to, uh, what? okay, here's, the, here's what I'm doing. I'm actually writing a book called The Dissenter's Guide to American History. And in that book, what I'm doing is I'm selecting out examples of civic virtue and uh you know it's dissent of course it's opposition to the ruling power but i defined dissent pretty broadly and so i picked out i picked uh, people out of in the revolutionary period and look at them and what i'm trying to do is create a, a positive narrative of the american past that can inform us today in our uh in our thinking about our relationship to the polity to to politics in this country and you know, and political activism and, and, you know, again, what I call civic virtue. Very important. Very important so, book. Yeah. Well, so what's the title yeah. of the book, John? What's, do you have a title? Sorry? What's the title? Yeah, it's called the, Dis the Dissenter's Guide to American History. Okay. And when's it coming out? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I've, it's several publishers are looking at it. Um, it's uh, under review, but I suspect the whole COVID issue is going to slow that down. But, you know, I'd like to think I would get a contract by the end of the summer, but I think COVID might change that. It might be the oh. end of the year. Yeah, I'm it'll not change sure. everything. Um, so here, here's Trump yeah. yesterday, and he's using exceptionalism, you know, right through that one hour diatribe, um, where right. I think the message, the takeaway, if you want to call it a takeaway, is that I'm rich, I have, but I have given a lot to this country. You should appreciate me. You should love me for what I have done for this country. I've done a great job. The government has done a great job, including especially with, with uh, you know, coronavirus. And by the way, uh, uh, what's his name? Fauci, uh, uh, Rauchy, Rauch was not, Rauch was not there. Uh, the, the, uh, the fellow who really, we, we do believe. And- um, Yeah, 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 Anthony, Anthony Fauci, yeah. Uh, uh, he was not there, and which which means I think that Trump took him off the stage because he was uh, he was not on Trump's team. Um, anyway, so <laughs> point the point though is he used exceptionalism, okay, as a way to gain public support 
for his own political position and ultimately, you know, his election, his the campaign uh, in right, November right. and the election. And, and, and what's interesting, though, is he says the greatest country on earth. We are doing a great job. We are capable of doing the most marvelous things on and on like that. And I, as your president, I'm a war president. And this is we have to come together. So he used the notion of exceptionalism to ask people to come together behind him. And I thought that was very interesting because I, you know, again, I question whether we are exceptional. I question whether he's exceptional. Well, he, he is exceptional, but in ways that you might not compliment him for. Well, yeah, he's exceptionally bad. He's the worst president we've ever had. Yeah. Uh, he's, a, so, he's an exceptional liar. He's the biggest liar we've ever had. So he's exceptional in, that, in those ways. Yeah, totally agree. And so the problem is <laughs> yeah. you've got people yeah. out there who would rather, rather than help their neighbor, rather than help the polity, they would like to buy ammunition. Uh, and that's mentioned in the Salon article. Um, so I'm, I'm just yeah, wondering, yeah. this is a degradation, a deterioration, an emasculation right. of the notion of exceptionalism, no? Right. So, yeah. So, um, so, uh, so the book itself, you know, the, the, the dissenter's guide, of course, I, I could talk all day about that. But, but to your question, I think the question really is then, and I think I've, I've thought about this for a long time, um, uh, because, uh, you know, my advisor, David Noble, actually was, uh, was a great man, by the way. You know, I, I love David. He died recently, but uh, really, really benefited from his tutelage and really miss him. So, but David wrote a lot about American exceptionalism. He, he wrote a, actually a book about American exceptionalism in the time period up to World War II. And what David was arguing is that uh, uh, there were, the scholars were trying to find various ways of fitting in their own ideas to the notion that the United States was ex exceptional, and it became increasingly difficult in the time period of World War II to argue that the United States was exceptional because the United States had spread its army worldwide. It was now engaged in a system uh, that was uh, global, actually, and it was very difficult. It's kind of difficult to maintain one distance uh, from the contagion, from the contagion of the, the evil of the rest of the world. Uh, and so, but where I picked this up is after World War II, I've done just a little bit of research on uh, the, the attempt to redevelop an idea, a, a truly kind of powerful idea, dollars of American exceptionalism in, in the post-World War II period. And this is in the 1950s and the 1960s when scholars began to argue that there was such a thing called an American civilization. And, uh, you know, and, and there were uh, textbooks about this. So the scholars were trying to get this into the classrooms. And there were other scholarly arguments that referred to this American civilization. And so um, I, you know, so, so there was this argument. And yet by the 1970s, I don't think anybody's talking about an American civilization. At and certainly point, nobody right? is I mean, talking about it now. Right. Nobody right. is so, talking about so this, that now. So, so, so this idea did not have enough power to move into the political discourse and to be something that, that uh, Americans kind of truly gravitated towards. Instead, of course, what happened was the civil rights movement and the uh, and the, you know, the Vietnam War and, uh, you know, things kind of blew up in a very interesting way in the 1960s. Uh, but I, I think that the notion that the United States was an, ex an exceptional place really took a hit in the 1960s with the Vietnam War. And then with the revealing, I mean, it wasn't the civil rights movement itself, but it was the revelation that uh, to the rest of the world, even that segregation existed at, you know, at very high levels in the South and that uh, that African-Americans were being denied their civil rights uh, in very significant ways, uh, which, you know, begs the question of how we could claim exceptionalism or an American civilization if we were doing these things to our own citizens. So, um, so I think that I think there's this kind of dual track that happens in the 1960s where you have uh, we have this new kind of cynicism about American government, a well-deserved cynicism, cynicism 
after the Vietnam debacle and after the, you know, as I said, the revelations about American racism. Uh, and then at the same time, you have the development of a very strong, uh, what I'll call rights consciousness in starting in the 1960s and then going into the 70s, the 80s. And so it's African-Americans gain civil rights and then women want more rights and then Hispanics want more civil rights and then uh, disabled people get more civil rights and and so on and so on. And so this idea of liberation and liberty, which is fundamental to what we would call the modern project, this idea of liberation actually gets encapsulated in this country, at least, in these individualistic, uh, individual liberty ways of thinking about it. And this and doesn't, I, I'm, I'm just not sure this helps the, uh, no. the idea of civic virtue, the idea that we can claim that we're somehow exceptional. Maybe we can claim we're exceptional in giving up, uh, you know, in, in repairing the civil rights of the country. Maybe we, we can claim that as exceptionalism, but I'm not sure that it, that it helps our framework of, of, you know, how we think about. No, how, uh, how the can politics. it, you know, the, the ultimate test, the ultimate yeah. test of any country or society or civilization, if you want to put it that level is, is whether, you know, uh, whether the people are engaged with the government, whether they, they, uh, they know about the government, they support the government, they participate in the government, and whether the government is listening and uh, engaging with the people. So the more, you know, uh, the more collaborative engagement there is between the people and the government, the better, the more optimistic you can be about the future, about the sustainability of this, this yeah. polity. Yeah. So, and we, and we had all divisiveness for, you know, growing divisiveness, I would say since, uh, since uh, Vietnam. Uh, and then, and yeah. then what accelerated it is the failure of the draft in the early seventies, uh, where we gave up the, uh, the, the connection between the military and the civilian worlds. Um, and yeah. so that was a parting yeah. of the ways okay. there and, uh, and that enhanced the right wing. But, but let, me, let me ask you this though, you know, if, if we are into sustainability, um, we, need, we need to sustain ourselves physically and technologically. We need to avoid having epidemics and pandemics because at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the philosophical end of things is going to be overtaken by the physical and medical end of things. If your country cannot survive, if your country is in shambles, the way our country was at such great risk in the 30s in the depression, um, you know, then we're really not sustainable. So uh, would you agree with me that, um, you know, the, the, the notion of exceptionalism is, and when it, where it's false, where it's not focused on the reality, it's a very dangerous business for the sustainability of the country. Yeah, but I would argue it's not exceptionalism at all. I, I, I think exceptionalism uh, is kind of a tool of propaganda in this day and age. Okay? We are not so disagree. not close to exceptionalism. But, but I would like to argue that we would push for survival and what you're talking about, sustainability, right? Resilience. Uh, and in that regard, we need a, a kind of a... a a renaissance of civic concern. And maybe something like uh, COVID-19 gives us some of that, this idea that neighbors should take care of neighbors, that communities should come together and cooperate when the government asks them to. Uh, so, and, and, and the thought is that you're, you're thinking about uh, yourself, but you're thinking about your relationship to one another and to your community and to the government and to politics. So you can't push yourself from that idea, but you actually have to think about yourself in that context. And it's quite important, uh, you know, and we've lost that quite frankly in the, in the last, again, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, again, what I would say is that uh, we need more study of this. We, meet, we need an academic study. We need a book on American exceptionalism and civic duty in the, the post-World War II period, and I suppose I'll have to write it at some point. But <laughs> I guess you will, John. Now, <laughs> one more, one now, more point is, is yeah, exceptionalism, you know, the whole notion of federalism is coming into play. Because uh, when, you know, Trump or others uh, use the term these days, however accurate or inaccurate it is, they're talking about the country in general. Um, and, and, they, and they're willing to take credit for any success, and they're willing to 
um, you know, blame somebody else for any failure. That's perfectly corporate of him. Um, but, you know, uh, I hate to use the word perfect these days, uh, but, but you know what, what strikes me is that what we see coming out at this, this, uh, this, this long press uh, conference yesterday and other uh, remarks he has made is, uh, I'm not going to do this myself, you guys, and I'm not going to take credit. I'm not going to even tell you I know about it. I want someone else to do it. I want the states to do it. It's kind of a bizarre federalism. You know, all you states, yeah, yeah, you yeah. fix it. I can't help you. I'm not going to help you. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm right. only going to maybe facilitate some things and yeah. I'll, I'll say, well, but I don't take responsibility. You have to take responsibility. Right. And th that troubles well, me look, on, a, on a really high yeah, profound of level. Of course. But, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Trump is, a, you know, when, when there's trouble, Trump is the first one to run <laughs> and pass the buck. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is, I don't think there's any surprise in this, you know, when, when he, when his company went, almost went into bankruptcy, what did he do? He, he went to his, uh, to his creditors and said, Hey, it's your fault. You need to, you need to bail me out. Right. So this is, you know, we can't count on civic virtue from Donald Trump, but I think we need to think beyond Donald Trump and not get too fixated on him. Uh, and I think to repair this, this, uh, notion of, of being, of having civic virtue, of caring about the community. I, I think, uh, you know, like I say, I think COVID can help that, but I really do think we need to re-energize the notion. My contribution to this would be, at least right now, the dissenter's guide in which I point out that, hey, what we have in history is tremendous effort towards civic duty and, and towards the polity, towards improving the polity, towards reducing injustice, towards uh, uh, making it a, a better country for the people who, the citizens who live in this country. And so we've got some great examples in our past of this. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, uh, uh, I, I, think, I think we don't have to say, look, things are really terrible and we can't recover. What we can say is, hey, we've got a, we've got a past that we can be proud of in some way. We don't have to be quite so negative and cynical about how our government has worked in the past. In some ways, this is a different kind of Vietnam syndrome in that a Vietnam invited uh, conscientious citizens to go, oh my gosh, this, you know, this is a terrible, terrible thing that the government has done. They, they kept secrets from us. They, they sent our, our sons into battle to die for no good reason. Uh, so, so I think in some ways we need to get over that Vietnam sy syndrome and we can do that by looking in other places for, for a usable past that allows us to think about our relationship to our, the threads, the, the declaration, the constitution, we can uh, strengthen those threads, reanimate those threads and bring those forward into our polity today and then start thinking about the country again through those things and then we'll go, wow, we need to take control of things. We need to repair the damage that's been done. This may force us to be more introspective. It is forcing us to be more uh, active and proactive on a state level, even a county level. But maybe, yeah. maybe it will connect us better uh, through those uh, new connections with states and counties and through uh, recognition the federal government cannot solve all our problems and that we have yeah. to solve our problems ourselves as, as a unified people. I, I hope that comes true, I, but I, I really regret the, all the suffering, the pain, and, and the fatalities that will that lie before yeah, us before we get there. Of course, there. yeah, 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 right. Well, thank yes, you, John. Jay, I agree. You're John welcome, John David, David Ann, a history professor uh, who helps us understand the past, the present, and the future <laughs> from Hawaii right. Pacific University here okay. on History Lab. Thank you so much, John. All right. Okay, take care.